Representative Acom, welcome to the committee. Uh, you are here to discuss with us House File 1213. Um, since you were not a member of the committee, I will recommend that House File 1213 be laid over for possible inclusion. Would you like to uh, state your name for the record and present your bill? Good morning, Madam Chair and members. I'm Representative Patty Acom. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm here to talk about House File 1213, which is a bill to remove the compensation cap on local government um, officials. And I will say currently we have um, kind of a patchwork uh, uh, landscape on um, those cities that are um, being held to this compensation cap and those that are not. And so um, there is a process that um, jurisdictions can um, apply to with the uh, um, Minnesota Management and Budget to be um, uh, an exception. Their community can be an exception from this uh, compensation cap. And so we see there is a um, long list, I believe it was um, a part of your packets, dozens of jurisdictions that are not being held to that standard. And um, so it, um, and, and because of that, it, provo it has some challenges. I will say that in this um, job market, as we know, it's a tight labor market. And so competition to attract and retain qualified staff is challenging. Um, I used to serve on a city council prior to coming to the legislature, so I know how um, important it is to get good staff um, for our local um, governments and want to make sure that the cities and counties and um, other jurisdictions have that opportunity. So the challenge of having um, neighboring cities maybe that are not being held to the cap um, can make it challenging and they can be attracted away by um, the, ne the neighboring communities that are doing better or having better opportunities for pay. And I will also say Minnesota is an exception as far as a state. We are surrounded by states that do not have these caps. And um, if you, I think there was also a letter submitted um, talking about some of the pay um, within the cities in our neighboring communities. And so um, coming from local government, I think it's important that we have local control. I think that um, it's important that our city councils and county boards are able to um, pay their staff accordingly for the important work they do. And so um, I think that it's important that we allow them to do that. Councils are elected and so they are held accountable to the decisions that they make. Um, and also to say local jurisdictions have to publicly um, list the top three staff that they have, top highest paid. And so there's a whole lot of transparency in how jurisdictions do their government and pay their employees. And so I think that um, for voters to be able to see that and, and recognize if that's something they agree with or not, um, they can certainly make their views um, heard to their community. So I think that um, it is time that we remove the cap given the patchwork um, of communities we have around um, the state that are um, exempt from this already. And so with that, I do have some, I will just also mention there were several letters of support that were sent in to the committee that should be part of your packet. And um, there are a few testifiers that I have um, with me today. Thank you very much, Representative Acom. <clears throat> we have four, mem four uh, individuals listed to testify. Uh, we will begin with Patrick Keene, then move to Rebecca Schnack, followed by Mr. Mossman, and then with Mr. Carlson. So if Patrick Keene would please come forward. Welcome council member. If you would please state your name and begin your testimony, that would be wonderful. Very good. Um, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Patrick Keene uh, and I'm a council member from the city of Rochester. Uh, this is my first time testifying in person and I'm here to speak <coughs> in support of House File 1213. I've been on our council for the past five years and I started, I'm just starting my third year serving the board of directors for our Rochester Public Utilities, the largest municipal public utility in the state. Our utility has over 57,000 electric customers and 41,000 water customers. When I testified via Zoom two years ago on the salary cap, I spoke about losing one of our highest uh, leaders in the public utility to another state. Today the issue remains very relevant for us both as a city and a public utility. 
Uh, our long-serving general manager um, has announced his intention to retire later this year, and so we've started the recruiting process. Um, given the large portfolio of specific skills for a utility, uh, we went uh, saw, see, seeking out professional uh, recruiting firms, uh, and we did hear back from some, but one I do want to share with you. One particular firm came back um, and said that they would like to work with a city like Rochester, but um, the comp their, their company will no longer work with Minnesota cities because of the recruiting and the state salary cap is too big of a barrier for their, for their processes. Mm -hmm. The city of Rochester is also going to be uh, to begin work to fill positions uh, of finance director and public works over the next two years, and we know we're going to run into these kind of problems, uh, and it's one of the reasons we're here speaking to you today. Um, the state salary cap is a retention issue, um, along with being a recruiting issue. Uh, at some point, salary caps uh, can become a demotivator uh, to stay in public sector jobs in Minnesota. Um, uh, top positions in, sm in smaller cities on our borders uh, know about our pay scales uh, and they selectively uh, recruit our top employees because of it. Um, and over time, private sector companies come to understand the salary constraints and they know how to make competitive offers, especially in the areas of like uh, cybersecurity uh, and finance and, and, uh, and, and civil engineers. Um, in closing, I do want you to, I do want to state clearly that city councils like ours in Rochester take our fiduciary responsibilities as our critical success factor. Um, in Rochester's case, our combined city services budget is over $600 million for 2023. We approve a tax levy each year and we're responsible to our voters uh, each election. And in between elections, we hear feedback from residents and from businesses. Um, city councils know that our local revenue and budgets are limited so financial decisions are made with the utmost care. With this understanding, I encourage you to eliminate the state's artificial cap uh, and allow city, city councils to address their topics, uh, just as we do with city budgets, um, with community development decisions, and with other matters that have local impact. Um, and with that, I'll wait for questions. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Next, we will have Rebecca Schmack. Welcome, Council Member. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair and, and um, committee members. My name is Rebecca Shack. I'm a Council Member for the City of Minnetonka. Um, I'm here today to support local control and the repeal of the compensation cap, caps that we're um, forced to adhere to. As an elected official, we should have the discretion to make the decisions about the salary and hiring of the executive, particularly executive levels of our city staff. The restrictions are artificially limiting our candidate pool, especially when we're looking at hiring positions like city manager, city attorney, and direct, other director level positions. Minnetonka recently went through a recruiting search process for our city manager. And when we were interviewing placement um, agencies and recruiters for the position, we, we narrowed it down to three recruiters. And to a person, one of the things they wanted to make very clear to us was that um, the candidate pool would be artificially limited due to the salary cap restrictions in Minnesota, which incidentally is the only state that has such restrictions. Specifically, one of our priorities in Minnetonka was to um, attract a diverse candidate pool. And because the experience and the diversity of candidates available within the state was fairly limited, we knew that we would probably have to look to folks um, from other states. It was just very difficult to attract them because of these uh, salary cap limits, especially in a place like Minnesota, which has a highly skilled and highly trained workforce. And obviously, um, many private corporations that can beat us on pay, and that's the bottom line. Um, we, we, our, we want to compete with the market. We want to attract the best people. That is a fiscally responsible thing to do. Um, I think it's, we all know that 
recruiting and um, hiring is a, is a significant expense. If we can keep folks working for us at our city level, that will save us money in the long run, even if it means we're paying them slightly higher salaries. The th compression is also an issue. Um, if we have directors who in the city of Minnetonka, we've got public works, community development, city attorneys, all who have been with the city for many years, they are incredibly valuable resources for us. They are pushing up against the salary cap as well. There really is an incentive for those folks to look to take that next step to the city manager position to be on call 24 seven to have added responsibility when there's really no financial incentive to take that on. The bottom line again to reiterate my colleagues is we're just looking for control as elected officials to make the decisions about compensation that we feel is most appropriate for our respective cities. Thank you so much for your time today and I, uh, I appreciate you considering the bill. Thank you, Council Member Schaff. Next, we will have Gary Mossman, followed by follow, Matthew Mossman, followed <laughs> by Gary Carlson. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Good morning, uh, Matt Mossman, with the Minnesota Intercounty Association, testifying in support of House File 1213 this morning. Micah represents 15 of Minnesota's larger and faster-growing counties, including four suburban and 11 Greater Minnesota counties. House File 1213 um, restores the market-based approach to setting compensation levels for local officials and it strengthens local control and accountability by aligning the authority for making compensation decisions with the local elected officials who are accountable for the work performance of the persons hired. Thank Representative Acom for authoring this legislation. Um, like all counties, our members are responsible for a complex array of public functions, many of which are required by the state and administered in partnership with the state. Just to give a quick partial scope of county governments, um, they administer all of the health and human so social service programs in the purview of DHS, state and federal programs, as well as public health, local public safety and supervision, roughly 88% of the probation caseload that would otherwise be the responsibility of DOC. A network of local transportation infrastructure that exceeds the lane miles of the state trunk highway system, housing, elections, property tax reform, land use, parks and trails, solid waste, and on. You know what counties do. Um, that's the role of counties. Counties embrace that work and do an excellent job of it. Recruiting, hiring, retaining the skills and expertise needed to lead that work is fundamental to successful outcomes. The compensation limit in the Minnesota statutes effectively entrusts counties to perform all of those functions, but then limits the decision-making authority for local government bodies over these basic compensation decisions. Compensation limit, the compensation limit severs the links between pay decisions and political accountability. Um, compensation for both public and private employers is fundamental to performance management, to retention, and especially for the executive leadership and highly technical and competitive skills such as IT, engineers, human service experts um, that are uh, highly competitive in the workplace with real consequences for the level of playing field and retention. Counties report significant salary compression as pay has risen over time, but not for, but has been capped for top salaries. Uh, one county described out-of-state recruits withdrawing from consideration upon learning of the cap. Other counties uh, uh, point out that it prevents uh, their local pay for, for performance um, strategies um, from working effectively. We included in your, uh, I had a handout and I just want to uh, speak to that because I think it helps illustrate that Minnesota local government employers, it's a regional and national marketplace and increasingly so. I don't want to suggest that those necessarily are the right levels or the levels that would be paid or the skill levels that their comparison in terms of um, what is needed. The point is that's a local case by case uh, decision making, but it's clear um, that local elected officials in other states um, are increasingly uh, paid at, at higher levels than many are in Minnesota. We appreciate that there is a waiver process, but it hasn't um, always worked uh, with, it sometimes has yielded confounding results and everybody is trying to, including MMB, is trying to do their best within uh, the statutes um, as they are written. But we have at least one situation in recent years where uh, a county experienced a very frustrating situation where uh, their uh, waiver request was denied um, because they weren't, uh, you know, sort of in the top five of the size of counties 
while a city uh, in that county, um, which is the third largest city, um, was granted a waiver request. Same marketplace, same job market, very similar skill sets. That's how the process works. In the end of the day, House File 1213 is a better solution uh, to let local elected officials make these local decisions, and we would appreciate your support, and I'll stick around for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mossman. Uh, Gary Carlson with the League of Minnesota Cities. Madam Chair and members, my name is Gary Carlson. I work with the League of Minnesota Cities. We represent 837 of the 854 cities across the state, soon to be 855 cities across the state. I want to testify in support of House File 1213 and thank Representative Acom for carrying this bill. We've been working on this issue for many years. This has been before this committee, as many of you know, I think for each of the last three biennia, and uh, we really want to get this across the finish line. Let me just say, uh, accentuate a few points. I think uh, Council Member Keene and Council Member Shack had, had some very good examples uh, locally. Uh, but let me just say that the, the waiver process uh, really is cumbersome and doesn't work very well. Uh, we have to come to MMB. MMB has to assess a job. Now, can you imagine being a state agency official trying to determine what a fire chief should make in some uh, Minnesota city? Uh, they are charged with a very difficult task. But not only that, uh, the recommendations of MMB must go to the Subcommittee on Employee Relations and they have the opportunity to weigh in as well. Uh, that is a process that uh, in my recollection has only happened a couple of times in the last decade where the SEC has actually met to consider these. And the last time I recall sitting in one of those committee meetings, uh, none of the members, many of you who may have served on that, really could understand how this process would work or how they could make an effective judgment about what the compensation should be for an individual position in an individual city or county. So with that, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that there is a uh, inflation adjustment that's applied to the cap every year. That's great. The problem is we have a serious market, a labor market problem right now. We're having a very difficult time uh, attracting and retaining employees. In Minnesota right now, I think uh, we have about two jobs for every one job seeker. And I think in the public sector, it's even a worse ratio. And when Minnesota is uh, hamstrung with this law, it makes it hard for our local governments to attract and retain employees. Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, encourage your support for the bill, and I would stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. We do have two members on the list right now. Um, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate the testimony, and uh, Mr. Carlson had and a few of the other testifiers uh, talked about the waiver process. I wonder if maybe we just need to refine the waiver process to make it uh, make the system work a little bit easier. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering about the history of when this came in and, and you know who's, a, who's being protected here uh, other than the taxpayers, but uh, it was indicated to me that uh, maybe certain counties are being protected uh, at the expense of other counties and if one of the testifiers uh, would would mind commenting on that? Mr. Well, Representative Acom, who would you wish to address that question? Mr. I Moss. will turn that over to Mr. Carlson. Um, Madam Chair, <laughs> Representative Kosnick, uh, individual counties and cities can uh, claim waiver or file waiver requests. Uh, and if a county or a city <laughs> isn't you know, quick at responding with a waiver request, if they have an employee that is being lured away or they have a job position where they didn't expect the market forces to be driving up the compensation necessary to attract and retain people. Uh, so you can have, and you do have, in fact, uh, there's a list of probably uh, 50 or 60 waiver requests that have come in, some of which have been approved and some of which haven't been approved. But really, um, as Mr. Mossman said, uh, the, the, I think the situation he was referring to was Olmstead County in particular, where they had a waiver request in at the same time the city of Rochester did. And Rochester being the third largest city in the state uh, was granted their waiver request. Olmstead County is not in the top, as Mr. Mossman said, top you know, 10 or so counties in terms of population, which is one of the criteria used by MMB to assess uh, what a compensation limit should be. And so they were not granted. That was in the same year, as I recall. So it can really depend upon how MMB does uh, evaluate those jobs. We're not blaming MMB. We think it's an impossible task for them to try to assess uh, what that compensation might be. 
You, Representative Acom. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Kosnick, I, I think it's really important that you talk about protecting the taxpayer. And that is something I think all jurisdictions um, hold very very dear and I don't think we're protecting the taxpayer when we aren't allowing when we're hampering front jurisdictions to be able to attract and re retain employees that are going to um, serve their communities well and so I think there is a unintended consequence to this I don't think this was put in place to hamper jurisdictions I think the unintended consequence is that it is well madam Ch madam chair um, I appreciate that representative Acom um, I guess I, you know, generally I've, I've been opposed to this and I'm just trying to figure out a little bit more of the history of it. It was kind of indicated that this was an attempt, if someone can correct me, but it was indicated to me, and I don't know that it's for certain, um, that maybe it was protecting Hennepin and County employees from coming in and working in other parts of the state with a salary cap or, or if something like that. So um, that was interesting to me as it was indicated, and I don't know that that's true, but um, if someone wants to expound on that, that would be great. But then I, I do want to note that uh, I appreciate, you know, this flyer from the Intercounty Association, and, and they do have a disclaimer on there that um, the salaries listed on there for the committee members uh, that have not been verified for accuracy. There has a county sheriff in North Dakota with a salary of something well over $520,000. It was indicated to me that that sheriff in that particular county makes about one hundred twenty. dollars 8,000. So um, I appreciate the disclaimer um, that that information isn't completely uh, correct, but uh, honest uh, mistake there. But I just think, uh, you know, we looking at the different testifiers here and, um, you know, previously in this committee, we had my own city of Lakeville come in uh, advocating for this. And uh, since then, we've been able to hire uh, an excellent police chief and a new director of economic development. And they're not even in the top three of the highest paid uh, staff in Lakeville um, and proud to have them on staff. They're doing a wonderful job taking a look at uh, the city of Rochester that testified in Minnetonka as well. Um, I believe 110% of the governor's salary is like 127,000 something and uh, the top people in Minnetonka and and Rochester uh, aren't they still have room to grow in, in that salary range. But is there other other than the actual wage uh, there are other retention strategies that have been implemented um, that I think would be around just the flat salary in terms of retirement. So when it says compensation, is that how, how we're talking about retention, uh, other retirement packages that can be enhanced? Are we, I, I think those are salaries or strategies that should could be looked at. Are, are, are cities and counties prohibited from enhancing other benefits rather than just re regular salary? Mr. Mossman. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Kosnick, uh, it is a compensation limit, not just a salary limit. So the, an the short answer to your question is no, those opportunities don't exist. So there's some, there's some finery around what that means, but in general, um, any, the only benefits that can be provided outside of the compensation calculation are benefits at levels that are generally available to all other employees um, within the jurisdiction. So, for example, if there was a, a car uh, benefit, um, that would ha be included within compensation. Representative Acom, and then we'll move on to Representative Bonner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I will only say that um, removing the cap doesn't mean that jurisdictions have to um, pay them more. It just means that they have the option to. And so cities such as, as Lakeville and others, there's no uh, requirement. It just means that they have another tool in their toolbox to be able to attract and retain the best employees. Thank you, Representative Acom. Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. And and thank you. I, I wanted to say I appreciate this, Bill. Um, you know, we have a bit of a push-pull happening here. There's a what what works in theory versus in practice, and I appreciate that Representative Aiken pointed out that you know, in theory, uh, back in 2005, we put this in place to really get at that whole idea of fiscal responsibility, protecting the taxpayer, which of course is the goal that I think we all strive for in this room, to be candid. Um, but in practice, um, you know, this is is really difficult. Um, I, our, I think in government we have two roles here, one to make government more efficient and two uh, to reflect, 
and at the same time, we need to reflect the reality on the ground in terms of the marketplace. Um, you know, one of the, the examples that come to mind for me is often the um, IT positions, which was mentioned here earlier. For example, our CISO, there's sort of a, a running joke that um, your chief information security offer is often a traveling person, right? <coughs> They're not expected to stay for very long because they are easily lured away uh, to other jobs and other places outside of state employment where they have a little bit less responsibility and a lot better benefits uh, and pay. So uh, I appreciate this bill be for that reason, uh, that it really is giving us the opportunity to, to say, you know, while in theory this was a great practice uh, in law, it may not uh, in reality uh, be the best thing for the state at this time. So thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair, and wanted to thank the author for uh, stopping me to, to chat through this and I, I've opposed this for a long time and there's a couple of, of reasons that I do that and the first is we're talking about the ability to attract and retain all employees by the city councils and we're talking about local control well having served on the city council you only have one employee it's the city administrator all other employees work for the city administrator or the city manager um, so and it, it's, it's kind of a, a, a somewhat disingenuous argument in that vein because you're not setting the, the rates for multiple people. It's uh, set for the top and then as Mr. Carlson and I uh, talked about and agreed yesterday, it then uh, affects what's called steps and lanes. It also re-indexes the entirety of everybody below that city administrator uh, and that's just fact. Uh, so I, I, I guess I don't mind the waiver process, I think that it's actually a pretty good process. Um, I, I, I just feel that what is a potential of what happens is that um, we wind up having the implication or the impact, sorry, the impact go to the taxpayer um, without really having the ability to have a full-throated conversation like we would uh, on this. Um, in my experience, and mind you, this was several years ago, but when we would have a, a step and lane increase, and lanes are based on experience or degree programs that you may have, you then expand out your ability to, to seek higher compensation. But that's, again, indexed off of what the city administrator is making. Um, so that becomes potentially quite expensive for the taxpayer. And you know, to the comment of earlier that um, Private corporations can just pay people more money. Well, that's because they're using private capital. When we pay public officials, uh, we're using taxpayer money. And I just think that having another, uh, another way to regulate this or slow it down to have a more thoughtful and deeper conversation is, is probably where uh, we should stay. Uh, I certainly recognize that attracting and retaining is important. But I, I forget who talked about it, but there were things that we put into the contract for our city administrator that w uh, the city would provide a car allowance. Uh, so that was a benefit. I think Representative Kosnick asked that question. So there are things that, that are malleable in that, but I, I just I have great reticence in, in doing this. So I'll be voting no. That's my personal vote. I'm not trying to dictate how my, my folks uh, here vote. I, I just think that for Jim Nash, um, I, I'm, I'm not a yes. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, Representative Acom, would you like to close? Thank you for the opportunity this morning. Um, I appreciate the conversation and the comments. Um, I do think it's important that we allow our local jurisdictions to have the opportunity to pay their staff um, or to um, attract staff staff I think there's something to be said about you get what you pay for and um, I don't want us to be um, local jurisdictions and government to only be attracting those mediocre candidates um, we want really good qualified people running our cities and our counties and so um, I thank you for the opportunity and appreciate your support today thank you and I'll thank you for bringing the bill forward I should have said this before you gave your closing but um, I really believe that we have high quality, high caliber individuals serving in our local and state government. And I don't believe that we should ask them to accept less because they've stepped into the, pub to the public arena. <coughs> so with that members, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, we will lay this bill over for possible inclusion. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.